Have you ever wanted to play as an elemental archer in Baldur's Gate 3? A character that's able to hit enemies from afar and add a shocking amount of damage with each attack? How about a character that's so elusive, enemies will struggle to even keep up with you, much less land their attacks on you? Well, the build we're showcasing today has both of these things in spades. And the best part, the gear needed to get this off the ground can all be found in Act 1, and it's already in places that you're most likely going to be exploring. This is the Lightning Charge Archer. I hope you guys enjoy. Before we get into the meat and potatoes of this video on where to find everything, I thought a demonstration was in order. The character I'm playing right now is a level 3 fighter, level 2 rogue. I started as a level 1 fighter to give myself longbow proficiency because the jolt shooter is going to be our main weapon, and we combo the lightning charge generation with the boots of speedy light feet, which also is able to generate lightning charges. My party is just outside of the Salunite outpost, and I am going to be fighting the Minotaurs over here for a little demonstration. The Minotaurs are extremely mobile, they have a massive leap, and if they are able to catch up to me, we might be in trouble. Now, as a level 3 fighter, I am not able to attack a crazy amount of times per round. Once we level up a little bit more, level 7 is going to be incredible. But we can simulate that early, by having a wizard in our party and casting haste. Before we do that, I'll go ahead and turn turn base mode on. Landing our attacks is also very important, so going into this fight, I'm going to have Bless as well. This is just normal party dynamic stuff. I have no special gear on these characters to make them do anything extra. We're just making sure that we are prepared for this fight. Now that I have my buffs, I am going to approach in stealth and see if we can spot an extra large cow. Look at that, almost on cue. Perfect, we're now in position in turn base mode. The world is paused and we can talk about what combination of abilities and attacks we're doing to make this build work. Every time we attack with this weapon, it's going to generate two lightning charges. Sometimes it generates three. I don't know why that is. We're comboing that with the speedy light feet. This is a pair of boots that every time you dash is going to grant you three lightning charges. What are these lightning charges actually for? Great question. Just by having lightning charges on our gear, we're going to deal an additional one damage with every single attack. And we have a higher chance of actually hitting our enemy. If we are able to generate five charges, which with this specific setup we can do every single turn, we're then going to add in an extra 1d8 lightning damage on that attack. There are also plenty of rings and amulets and things that can give you extra damage with each attack, so this is only the beginning. This is at the start of the game, basically. Before I begin combat, I'm actually going to get very close to the Minotaur here. If you attack in turn-based mode, sometimes it removes your surprise round. So I'm just going to turn off the pause and then as soon as I can attack this guy, we will go ahead and do that. That first attack generated three lightning charges for us for some reason, and we will get extra damage, that extra D8, once we have five charges. We can easily get there by using a cunning action dash. This is simply a bonus action because of our levels in Rogue, and that means we still have two more attacks that we can do this turn. That attack brought the Minotaur down to 53 HP, and let's fire off another one here, which generates three more lightning charges. Because we're on the surprise round, I'm just going to stand still. The other Minotaur is also surprised surprised, and now we continue to repeat the cycle. If you look over on the left, I'm at two lightning charges. Once you end your turn, you're going to lose one charge every round. So all we have to do to get back to that extra damage is use a dash, which brings us back up to five, and then we attack, adding in that extra 1d8. We can shoot again which for some reason our lightning charges weren't consumed that last time, and I don't know why. And if we just go ahead and action surge, we should be able to finish off one Minotaur in a single round. So what about this guy over here? Are we worried about him? Of course we are, but we're so far away that I don't even think we need to move at all. And if I play my cards right, he's going to use his action 
as a dash. So now when I dash, I'm simply moving further out of his range. Now, before I move, I am going to fire off a shot because we have enough lightning charges. Fire off another shot. I don't have action surge this time, but the Minotaur is already at half health. And then with the extra movement speed from my dash, I'm simply going to try to get so far away from this Minotaur again, that his only choice is to dash to follow me, once again, giving up his attack. Now I did cheese it a little bit. He does have a bit of a jump that he can use to uh, potentially knock me down. What would we do in that instance if he was able to gap close on me? Great question. We can still utilize the charges from our dash to protect us by using this shield. It has a lightning aura that we can use, but it only works if we have three lightning charges. We get three just from sprinting. Now that we have the lightning charges, lightning aura will use one of our attacks this turn and cause the Minotaur to be jolted. This means that I can walk directly by him without incurring any attack of opportunity whatsoever. And that jolt is a massive AOE, so no one around me would be able to attack me. We move slightly out of our range, and I'm gonna try to make up for that. Firing off one shot into the back of the Minotaur, that is a critical miss, but it doesn't matter. Because of our dash, we've moved so so far away from him. I even moved the worst way possible. So on his turn, he's forced to once again dash, give up his attack, and then try to get back to me. The best part, the jolt from this lasts three turns. So I can now sprint again, give myself more lightning charges, fire off a few more attacks onto the Minotaur, and profit with all of the extra damage that we are throwing into the rotation. Now, if I need to move away from again, <laughs> look how far I can go. This is 112 feet. By the way, I play in feet. I know that's jarring for most D&D &D players. I'm sorry. I'm just going to move this way and once again try to avoid him. What does he do on his turn? A reckless roar because he's so mad and then dashes to try to get to me. If he got in range, the lightning aura is still going. I'd be able to walk away without incurring an attack of opportunity, but he didn't even make it there. And we take him down no problem. I have been soloing most fights in the game like this, and it is incredibly fun. If you would like to do this for your playthrough as well, I'll show you where the most important gear comes from right now. Like I said, a lot of these items can be found very early in the game. We're going to focus on picking up the speedy light feet boots first. The reason is it's actually on the way to get the weapon. It's incredibly optimized. We're going to find these boots inside of the Blighted Village, the very same village the goblins took over. We have to make our way over to the windmill, and the outcome of this encounter really doesn't matter because the boots themselves are located behind the windmill inside of a chest in the cellar. Whenever we dash, we're going to gain three lightning charges. It is a key component for this setup. Immediately from there, we can travel north, jumping over the gap in the bridge and make our way over to Joaquin's Rest. Here, there is a building on fire and a very important person inside. In order to break this person out and save them, I just had Lazel walk up to the door with her big old sword, chop it down, run up to the top floor, chop down another door, and out comes Counselor Floric. This really isn't even a combat encounter. You could do this right at the start of the game. The reward for this quest is the Jolt Shooter, our primary weapon, but there are some other options here. So if you guys would like to see a caster version or a melee version of a lightning charge build, let me know down in the comments. We, of course, went with the longbow. The combo for this weapon and boots comes online at level three as a level one fighter and two rogue. And at that part of the game, you're gonna be one-shotting goblins. It's not even a competition. Next, we're gonna have to go all the way down to the Underdark to find the real Sparky Sparks Wall. This is the shield that gives us that awesome lightning aura that allows us to get away from any melee threat without having to disengage. The area we're looking for is kind of northwest of the Grim Forge Waypoint in the Underdark. So you are gonna have to travel across the water down there in order to get here. However, your journey will be well rewarded. I think this shield is definitely worth it. 
those are the three items that I would say are mandatory for this build. However, if you would like to continue to lean into the lightning charges idea, there is a circlet you could buy at the Myconoid Colony in the Underdark, sold by Blurg, the like red orc? He's an orc, right? What is, what is Blurg? I would say this circlet is okay. Every time you get a lightning charge, you're going to gain three temporary hit points. This does not stack. It's always going to be three. It will reduce your chip damage a little bit, especially over the course of the fight, but there's definitely going to be better options than this later in the game. Next, we're going to talk about the Jolty Vest. This is a quest reward from the Find the Missing Shipment quest on the high road. Basically, there's some gnolls that are trying to kill some guys in a cave. If you protect those guys, they will tell you about their secret hideout area and the fact that they were trying to get this shipment back there. If you help them do it, you'll be rewarded from a merchant in their hideout named Brim, who will allow you to shop from their goods that they don't normally sell to the public. The Jolty Vest is one of those items. If you have lightning charges and an enemy attacks you, they have to pass a dexterity saving throw or become shocked. Now, shocked just means they can't take reactions, which we're already accomplishing with our shield anyway. I went through the trouble of getting this. I recommend you just try to find some more AC out there so it's even less likely that you're going to be hit. There are some decent accessories that you can pick up in Act 1 as well. Things like the Broodmother's Revenge as a necklace. This will give you a 1d4. Keep in mind the tooltip there is actually wrong. Poison damage added onto your weapon. You can achieve this also just by dropping a candle on the ground, lighting it, and dipping your weapon into that flame to add another 1d4. So not necessary. Also, if you do need to be healed, that likely means using a spell slot, so it is actually kind of expensive. If you do want to get this item, it comes from Kaga in the Druid Grove. The Caustic Band is sold by one of the vendors in the Myconoid Colony and just adds two acid damage onto every shot. As we continue to level up, that damage will also add up as we're firing more and more shots downrange. Lastly, the Strange Conduit Ring can also be picked up in Act 1. If you're concentrating on a spell, it's going to give you a 1d4 bonus to your psychic damage on top of everything else that we're throwing in there as well. This ring does require concentration, so if you go for something like an Eldritch Knight, you could be concentrating on a defensive spell or an offensive one, something like Crowd Control, to just throw some extra damage in there. I'm actually a very big fan of this ring. Of course, because we are an archer, the Gloves of Archery are a great pickup early in the game as well. These are sold at the Goblin Encampment by the merchant who's overlooking the party outside with everyone drinking and having a good time. These gloves would have given us proficiency with longbows and shortbows. We already had that from being a fighter. The important part here is that two additional damage on every single shot, just like the ring before, that adds up over time. If you still hear the sound of my voice, congratulations, you made it to the end of the video and I hope you enjoy it. Remember, this is just my take on what a lightning archer may look like, and this will get you going easily into act three with this exact setup. I hope you guys enjoyed today's video. If you did, please be sure to hit that thumbs up button. I make a ton of Baldur's Gate content here on this channel, and I'm hoping this could be a good entryway for new people to come in and enjoy the rest of the content that we're making as well. I have at least two more builds ready to go that are also focused on the early game, and we're going to be making some videos for those soon too. So I'll see you guys again very soon. Thank you so much for being here.